It's August again, and it's been a year since I made an episode about Dutch mushrooms. And for the last couple of weeks, we've had nothing but rain, and the entire forest is filled with mushrooms. So I really had to change my schedule, because usually I start filming mushrooms in September, October, and some species can be found in August. But right now, it's early August, it's 16 degrees Celsius, it's been raining for weeks, and many species are everywhere. So I really had to change my schedule, especially because I'm suffering from some health problems. Uh, but I decided to go here uh, this weekend to shoot some mushrooms for you guys. So please join me for episode 17, Dutch Mushrooms, part two. And if you saw my last episode about mushrooms, you'll probably recognize this one. This is the so-called Earth Star. And these are fantastic mushrooms because they open up like little flowers. Once they open up, they reveal the inner endoperidium, which is a sac that holds the spores. And once the endoperidium is hit by rain, it releases spores. And today I'm going to shoot some nice slow motion footage of rain hitting this endoperidium. So you can see this spore cloud being released uh, in slow motion by the mushroom. It's just fantastic. This is also a beautiful one. This is known as the coral fungus, Ramaria formosa. And me being a marine biologist and specializing in corals, I really love it when corals and fungi come together, at least in, in the sense of morphology. And this fungus, like many, is toxic as well. So if you consume this, you'll get the typical signs of nausea and vomiting. And this coral fungus grows rapidly after a short period of rain and it disappears as quickly as it came. It's very difficult to cultivate, it needs a lot of moisture. And usually in the Netherlands we see this appear in summer and fall. And just for a couple of days you can enjoy these beautiful structures, these beautiful fungi uh, that look a bit like branching corals, like staghorn corals. They're usually yellow, but you can also find beautiful purple and pink species. And after a couple of days this fungus will completely wither and die. Beautiful. And this is it. This is the best location in this entire area to find mushrooms. You can find all sorts of species over here. And this is one of them, Amanita phalloides, also known as the death cap, one of the world's most toxic mushrooms. Well, this is a good find for me. This is known as the blusher mushroom, Amanita rubrescens. And I have never seen this species in this area, so I'm very happy to come across it. And this mushroom is a member of the Amanita family like the panther cap, the fly agaric, but also the very poisonous death cap. This one is actually quite edible after you cook it properly. And you can differentiate this species from the other amanitas in various ways. And the most reliable feature that allows you to distinguish this species from the more toxic ones is the fact that it bruises, it blushes once you damage it. 
So if I were to cut up this, this mushroom, it would slowly turn red. And the reddish color is an indication that this is the rubrescence, the Amanita rubrescence, so the blusher mushroom. This one looks quite similar to the panther cap, Amanita pantherina. But that one usually has spots on the cap that remain even after some rain. The blusher mushroom often loses its spots after several days of rain. And these spots are a remnant of the veil which fully enveloped the mushroom when it was still in its, in its egg. I would not recommend using spots as a reliable feature to determine if you can eat this because the pantherina can be quite toxic, more toxic I believe than the, this blusher mushroom. And if you cook this mushroom properly, supposedly it has a very nice beefy taste, a very meaty beefy taste. I have no experience in this matter so I cannot uh, comment on that but I think in England and France and Italy this mushroom is quite popular for its edible properties. But if you're not an expert in amanitas, I would leave these in the forest. I would not pick them and cook them because you can get very ill if you um, do not cook this, this species properly or if you take the fly agaric or the, the panther amanita, the panther cap, which are quite similar. And you definitely do not want to pick a greenish one, which is likely to be the death cap, Amanita phalloides, and that one can actually kill you in two weeks. Um, you can also watch episode one, where I describe in detail how that mushroom will take your life, if you're not careful. And like all members of the genus Amanita, this species lives in symbiosis with trees. It exchanges water and nutrients with trees, and that's how it can live. So it's a uh, an ectomycorrhizal fungus that really needs a specific soil and specific species of trees to grow. Ah, oh, look at this, beautiful. This is another blusher mushroom, but this one is still in an intermediate stage. So this is a younger version, a younger specimen of the Amanita rubrescens, the blusher mushroom. And this is how they usually look in the literature. And as you can see in this stage, the blusher mushroom superficially resembles the fly agaric. But of course, it's beige and not red. And over here is another nice example of a blusher mushroom. This one has been damaged by a slug, by a slug feeding on this mushroom. And you can clearly see that this mushroom has turned red around the area of damage, around the wound. And this is why we call this the blusher mushroom. Because fly agarics, and as I said, the other uh, amanitas do not blush, do not discolor red after damage. And look what we have here. The most iconic mushroom in the world, the fly agaric. And over here in the Netherlands, fly agarics can usually be found from August until the end of October. And the peak usually lies in October. Now, in part one of Dutch mushrooms, I explain the anatomy of mushrooms in great detail, using the fly agaric as an example. And this specimen over here does not have the typical white spots of the fly agaric. That's part of the aesthetic, the beauty of this mushroom. And this is because rain has washed off most of the spots. And these spots are actually remnants of the universal veil, which, as I previously talked about, envelops a young mushroom when it is still in its egg. And when fly agarics burst out of their shell, out of their egg, those typical white spots that make the, this mushroom so beautiful and attractive remain behind on the cap. And when the rains start, these white spots are washed off quite quickly resulting in a specimen like this. And if you look closely, at the base of this mushroom is mucus. And this has probably been left by a, a slug, uh, so a snail without a shell. And it feasted on this mushroom over here. You can see this hole in the stipe, or the stem. And slugs, they really love their mushrooms. And they often start feeding on mushrooms when they're still in their egg. And once these mushrooms emerge, all sorts of holes can be found in them. Now interestingly, 
These slugs also feed on death caps, Amanita phalloides. And somehow this toxin is, is very deadly to humans, but not to these slugs, as they can completely devour these toxic mushrooms in a couple of days. So these slugs must have found some way to deal with this toxin. Now look at this plant. I know this is an episode about Dutch mushrooms, but I'm going to cover this plant anyway. Due to all the rain in August, as I just mentioned, we have a lot of mushrooms growing. But in August, these orchids are still in bloom. So now we have orchids and mushrooms growing together. And this orchid is also known as the broad-leaved helleborine, or the helleborine orchid. And this orchid is almost exclusively pollinated by wasps. So in Dutch we call it the white wasp orchid, roughly translated. So some of you might think, why are you looking for mushrooms in summer? I mean, you can see all the herbs flowering next to me. But here is the dark, moist forest. And in this forest you can find lots of mushrooms. And I'm sure that if you go into your local forest in summer, you go deep into the forest where it's wet, where it's humid, you'll find lots of beautiful summer mushrooms. So check it out, go out there and try to find some summer mushrooms. So, have a look. Now, in part one of Dutch mushrooms, I explained to you how the shaggy ink cap dissolves itself, thereby releasing its spores. And this dissolving is known as autolysis. But these fairy ink caps do not dissolve themselves, despite being relatives of the shaggy ink cap. And these ones simply release their spores into the ground without dissolving. And when the rains stop, these ink caps just slowly wither away. And as you can see, they're growing on a typical spot, namely a fallen, a fallen tree. They're beautiful little mushrooms. And this is what I love about going into the forest. I'm looking for mushrooms, but I stumble across badger prints. And here is a small entrance hole, probably made by a small badger. You can see the typical J pattern, uh, which is this pattern over here, where the badger excavates the sand or the clay. But it smells like, uh, like a fox right now, so maybe a fox took over this, uh, this small entrance hole. Well, it's like I told you, always go out there and explore. You'll be amazed at what you'll find. And this specimen over here is known as an earth ball. And these are relatives of puff balls. And when animals step on them, they explode, releasing a spore cloud. And that's how they reproduce. And here is one lying loose in the sand. And you can see where the fruiting body, the, the puff ball, was connected to the mycelium. So this is kind of the root system of this fruiting body. And these are mycelial strands that went down into the substrate. And this is where the, the fruiting body matured from, from the mycelium, the, the body of the fungus, which was growing in the soil. And we can open this up because it's already been disconnected from its mycelium anyway. So I'm going to open this for you and show you the spores. Well, I don't have a knife with me, but this stick will come in handy.
Now here you can see the spore mass. And you can imagine that when animals step on these fruiting bodies, on these bubble balls, they release a giant cloud of spores. And this is a very effective way for the, the fungus to reproduce, to spread its spores across the forest and the rest of the world. Well, it's now almost September and it's a beautiful late summer day and we've had a few days of rain which for me means looking for mushrooms and if you find yourself in a place like this surrounded by lots of decaying rotting wood you might as well check for stinkhorns and usually I go stinkhorn hunting in September or October but now in late August we have plenty of stinkhorns over here and I found a beautiful patch of dark stinkhorns over there. And I'm going to show you a few of these dark stinkhorns. But first, I need a little lunch break. As I mentioned, stinkhorns love decaying wood. And have a look. Usually I find these in November, maybe late October. That's one. That's a beautiful dark stinkhorn. And over there you can find a lot more stinkhorns. Look at how many. These are from the last couple of days. I've never seen so many together, especially not in August. They call this stinkhorn the dog stinkhorn because supposedly it has a feces-like smell. But it smells more like cat feces to me. And as I explained in part one of Dutch mushrooms, this smell is supposed to attract carrion flies and beetles and such. And these insects, they will feed on the gleba, which is the sticky spore mass that you can find on the cap, on the, the, the top part of the stinkhorn. And when carrion flies and such feed on this stinky gleba, they uh, carry the spores with them in their digestive systems and when they fly away they will deposit these stinkhorn spores uh, at other places in the forest and that's how these these fungi reproduce and stay tuned because later in this episode i will show you a stinkhorn that attracts many carrion flies because it really smells like a rotting carcass and this is known as the devil's fingers fungus or the octopus stinkhorn and that one is really stinky and if you like to know where stinkhorns come from, well, they erupt from these so-called witch's eggs or devil's eggs. And here you can find a few. And you can clearly see that these eggs are connected to the mycelium of the fungus. You can see these hyphal strands, these, these thick strands that pump nutrients into the eggs. And that's how these, these fungi produce these fruiting bodies. And when enough water pressure has been built up, they burst through the top of the egg over here. Well, there it is, the common stinkhorn, also known as Phallus impudicus. In my previous mushroom episode, I told you a lot about these stinkhorns. 
and the last couple of days we've had a lot of rain and heat and that combination of humidity and heat makes these stinkhorns emerge very quickly from their devil's eggs or witch's eggs and here you can see a cluster of these stinkhorns and this one has emerged I think last night and you can see that it is covered in carrion flies and these flies are attracted by the smell that this stinkhorn produces and you can see this olive green spore mass on the cap of the stinkhorn and that is full of spores and these spores are eaten by the flies which carry these spores in their stomachs in their digestive systems and they will spread these spores all over the world and that's how these stinkhorns of course reproduce and usually you find these stinkhorns with a stark white cap when all the glebe has been removed already and that's why you have to go out into the forest early in the morning because usually these stinkhorns emerge at night and then in the morning when the flies are active they will quickly consume all the gleba. So if you want to see these stinkhorns in such a beautiful shape as this one, go out at dawn in fall or summer and hopefully you're lucky. And of course you have to be able to tolerate the pungent smell. It's called a stinkhorn for a good reason. But I do feel that the beauty of these stinkhorns more than makes up for the nasty smell. Beautiful. And in 19th century England, in Victorian England, people were often quite embarrassed by these stinkhorns due to their morphology. And they would often be destroyed so as not to offend any impressionable ladies. And there's a story about Charles Darwin's eldest daughter, Eddie Darwin. And supposedly Eddie went into the forest occasionally hunting down these stinkhorns, removing them and burning them into a fire so as not to offend the housemaids. So it's interesting that people back then had a very different view of these amazing mushrooms. It's now late September and as you can tell it's been raining a lot so it's a perfect day for some mushroom hunting. Now these are also beautiful. These small yellow mushrooms are known as sulfur nights or stinkers and the reason they're called this way is because they have a sulfury smell. It smells a bit like old coal gas which also has a sulfur smell when you burn it. So I'm going to remove one, since we have many growing in this area. I think it's okay to remove just one for educational purposes. And indeed it has that very sulfury smell, that brimstone smell. And this one, like many mushrooms in Europe, is poisonous. It's bright yellow, it smells pretty bad, and that should be your first, your first sign that you shouldn't eat it. I don't think many people will eat this because it really smells quite bad. And if you eat this, you get the usual symptoms of stomach upset and diarrhea. The typical signs of mushroom poisoning. But these are quite beautiful and they're even found in North America, even though it's not native over there. In Turkey, it's considered endangered. You can also find this species in the UK. Usually it's in leaf litter, like in this area over here and in the Netherlands this is quite a common mushroom and like Amanitas this species is also ectomycorrhizal so it needs an association with trees to grow yeah a beautiful little mushroom And here is a beautiful specimen of the false death cap, or Amanita citrina. And this species is often confused with the real death cap. And there's another mushroom next to it, 
which has already broken off due to the rain. So that allows me to nicely explain the differences between the real death cap and the false death cap. So here you can see the pileus or cap of the false death cap, the Amanita citrina. And if you look closely, you can see that the false death cap has these spots on the cap, on the pileus. And these spots are remnants of the veil which enveloped the mushroom when it was still in its egg. And this is a fantastic feature to allow you to distinguish the real from the false death cap. The real death cap, the Amanita phalloides, never has these spots, these veil remnants on its cap. Whereas the Amanita citrina usually does. So if you see these clear spots on the cap, it is most likely the false death cap, the citrina. And there's another distinguishing feature between the false death cap and the real death cap. And that is the structure of the stipe here. The stipe of the false death cap is pretty coarse. It's pretty shaggy. Whereas the real death cap usually has a much smoother stipe. But this feature may be less reliable than the spots on the pileus on the cap. Now I wouldn't pick these for consumption. You could eat these if you boil them properly, just like the fly agaric, which is closely related to the citrina. Regardless, I would just leave these in the forest and admire them. There are plenty of other mushrooms, like bolides, which are more edible than this one. And the false death cap also lives in association with trees. And in this area you can find a lot of oak and birch trees, and that's a perfect mixed deciduous forest for false death caps. And a week from now I expect a lot of fly agarics to pop up. Because it's now raining and in this area the false death caps, the citrinas, usually precede the muscarias, the fly agarics, by one to two weeks. Beautiful. Beautiful, isn't it? To most, this remains the most iconic mushroom, the fly agaric, Amanita muscaria. And this mushroom is gaining attention on social media, including YouTube, for its supposed medicinal properties. This mushroom produces a lot of metabolites, including ibotenic acid and muscarin. And muscarin specifically has gained a lot of attention for its supposed anxiety relief properties. Some people cook this mushroom or they dry it and they microdose this mushroom, consuming small amounts, thereby ingesting small amounts of muscarin. And supposedly this helps them relieve anxiety and stress. And there are even stories about ancient warriors in Europe, such as Vikings, consuming small amounts of this mushroom before battle to make them more fearless. Regardless of its medicinal properties, if you boil this mushroom long enough, it will lose its red coloration. A lot of the ibotenic acid will be degraded. Uh, and this prevents you from getting sick after eating this mushroom. So if you boil it long enough, it is safe to consume. And the taste is supposed to be quite nice. I myself have no experience cooking and consuming these mushrooms. So I will leave this specimen in the forest.
Now this may be the most amazing mushroom you can find over here in the Netherlands. This is known as Clathrus archery, also known as the devil's finger stinkhorn or the octopus stinkhorn. And it's too bad that I came here a little early in October because this egg has not yet ruptured. And all around me you can find these devil's eggs. And once these erupt, they show an octopus-like structure consisting of four to six arms that are bright red, scarlet red. And the smell resembles carrion, a dead animal. And this to me remains the most spectacular mushroom that you can find over here. And Clathrus archery, or the devil's fingers, supposedly originated from Australia. And it came to Europe uh, at the end of the First World War, around 1918. The story goes that uh, spores from this mushroom came to Europe uh, in military supplies, mostly in the form of wool or linen. Uh, and maybe army boots also carried some spores from Australia to Europe. Either way, from the 1920s onwards, this stinkhorn has been observed more frequently in Europe and also in the Netherlands. So these are a few eggs of the octopus stinkhorn. These are quite small. Usually they're a bit smaller than those made by the common stinkhorn. And you can see that the slug has feasted on one of these eggs. Now the octopus stinkhorn somewhat resembles the common stinkhorn. But where the common stinkhorn has one stem, one stipe, the octopus stinkhorn has evolved to produce a split stem. And that's where the arms come from. It's basically a stem that has split into four to six structures that we call arms. And where the common stinkhorn has its gleba, its spore mass on top, on the cap, the octopus stinkhorn has its gleba on the inner side of the arms. So running along each arm on the inside, you can find the gleba, the spore mass. And of course, the arms of the octopus stinkhorn are bright red due to the production of keratins, pigments. And the smell that this stinkhorn produces is absolutely horrible. It truly resembles carrion. It really smells like a dead animal lying on the side of the road, stinking in the sun. And of course this combination of red coloration and smell may be particularly attractive to certain insects, such as carrion flies and beetles. So it is an absolutely fascinating stinkhorn. To me it's the most beautiful and most weird mushroom you can find over here. The Devil's Fingers or Octopus Stinkhorn. Well, it's now late autumn and I've come to this beautiful beech forest. And I love visiting this place in late autumn. Because once the first night frost hits the leaves, they turn into beautiful shades of ochre, amber and yellow. That's the beauty of a beech forest in late fall. And I've come here to show you some beautiful mushrooms that are quite unique, quite specific to a beech forest. And what's typical about a beech forest is its canopy, which is very dense. So very little light penetrates to the floor of the forest. So the undergrowth, the understory is very light. There's very little plant growth. And this provides certain opportunities for fungi or specific low light plants to grow. And I often find very specific mushrooms in this area. One of them is the rooting shank which is a typical mushroom found in beech forests.
And another species that I typically find in a beech forest is the white saddle, such as this specimen over here. And this is quite a fascinating mushroom, because it has a very convoluted cap, which kind of looks like a saddle. It looks like it could be used by elves for horseback riding. And the stem is also quite atypical. It looks like a, like a bunch of spaghetti strings glued together. It has a lot of cavities, it's very hollow. It looks like a very brittle mushroom. And you can find a lot of these mushrooms over here. And this species should not be considered as being edible. It's actually poisonous and according to some it may even be carcinogenic. Not one for the table. And this is quite a special one for this area. This is known as the lurid bolete, Boletus luridus. And this bolete is edible, but it's quite hard to distinguish this one from the more toxic species. So be very careful, make sure that you identify the species properly, should you want to pick it and cook it. You have to cook this one well before you can eat it. And the easiest way to verify that this is the lurid bolete is to cut its flesh. Once you cut this bull lead, its flesh will almost instantly turn blue. So the stem of this bull lead is usually orange to red, with red striations. And if I were to cut this stem, it would quickly turn blue. But since this species is quite rare in this area, I don't want to show you. I think it's a waste of this beautiful mushroom. And these bull leads do not have gills like Amanitas. They have pores on the underside of their caps. So it's a completely different class of mushrooms. And in the UK, for example, a lot of people love to forage bull leads because some of them are edible, but be careful. And the lurid bull lead, like in this case, often grows in beech forests. It's now almost November and you can see that the forest is really getting its beautiful autumn colors. And during late fall, you find a lot of different species of mushrooms as compared to early fall. And that's why I came out here today, to see if I can find some more beautiful mushrooms before fall is over and the winter sets in and all the mushrooms, all the fungi lie dormant. This species is known as the trooping funnel. And as its name suggests, these mushrooms have a funnel shaped or concave cap. And interestingly, when these mushrooms are still young, they start out as having a convex shape. And when they grow older, the cap flips up, turning into a concave shape or a funnel shape. And these mushrooms can grow quite large. The cap can be as wide as 8 inches or about 20 centimeters. So these are still quite small. And supposedly they have a sweet almond taste. So this one is damaged, so let me pick this one. So as you can see the stem is quite long. And it has beautiful gills on the underside of the cap. And this species is edible. Indeed, it has that slight sweet aroma that is somewhat reminiscent of almond. And this species is quite common in Europe, although I only know of one place over here in the Netherlands where they grow. And in North America it is quite rare, and some people consider this species a real delicacy, having a very unique almond taste. Beautiful.
I really hope you enjoyed part two of Dutch mushrooms. And please let me know what other species of mushroom or plant or animal you would like me to cover in the next episode. For now, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.